Welcome to Macro Musings, where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the most important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I am your host, David Beckworth, a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, and I'm glad you decided to join us. Our guest today is Brian Sack. Brian was recently the Director of Global Economics at the D.E. Shaw Group, and prior to that, he was the Manager of the System Open Market Account, or SOMA, and the Head of Markets Group at the New York Federal Reserve Bank, where he managed the Fed's balance sheet. Brian joins us today to discuss the Fed's balance sheet, its operating system, and his work at the Treasury Borrowing Advisory Committee. Brian, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much for having me. I, I enjoy your show, so it's a real pleasure to be here. Well, it's a real honor to have you on. I've had some of your former colleagues and current friends on the show. So it was only a matter of time until I got you on the show, Brian. That may say something about your show or something about my friends. <laughs> not sure which. No, you run in great circles. In fact, I've had one of your close friends, Joe Gagnon, on several times. And I believe one of the papers you guys co-authored together, we talked about. So he had a paper on QE, and I think he threw in nominal GDP targeting, which made me very happy. And we kind of all brought that together in a, in a show some time ago. So in fact, we'll talk about a paper that you and Joe have written on the Fed's operating system later in the show. So I'm excited to chat about that as well. But Brian, you've had a very interesting career, a storied career at the Fed. You went from the Board of Governors to the New York Fed. As I mentioned in the introduction, you managed the Fed's balance sheet, and then you went to Wall Street. Walk us through your career and tell us how it unfolded. As you noted, I I started my career at the Federal Reserve Board down in D.C. I mean, I think in general, I've just been very fortunate on my career path to have had very interesting and unique positions inside the Federal Reserve System and then to have worked at a couple of tremendous firms outside the Fed in places that just let me continue to think about policy issues. So the Federal Reserve Board was a great place to start a career. I had tremendous colleagues there, several great bosses, including Don Cohn, who went on to become vice chair of the Fed. And I think it was just a great place for learning how to think about policy issues very carefully and very deeply, you know, with lots of of analytical support. And that was really the foundation for, you know, everything, everything that came next. In about 2004, I was at the, at the board for seven years. And then in 2004, I was pulled away to a firm called Macroeconomic Advisors. There I worked with Larry Meyer, who had been a governor at the Federal Reserve Board. And what we did there was a lot of economic and interest rate forecasting for financial sector clients. So it wasn't didn't take me very far from the policy world, but it certainly had a different focus. And Larry was another you know, great mentor of mine, you know, just really taught me how to be, you know, directional in my thinking and no one wanted to pay for a service, you know, where you'd have a two-handed economist not, you know, making any forecast. So that's really what I learned there was, was how to be directional. And then the financial crisis came and I was pulled back into the New York Fed, as you noted. And the New York Fed, you know, the situation there was Bill Dudley had been, was the head of the, of the markets group as the financial crisis unfolded. So he was there through 2008, there through the the tensions in the market in 2008 and the situation after Lehman. And as you know, uh, Bill Dudley then was elevated to become the president of the New York Fed and got in touch with me and asked me if I would consider applying for the markets group job. And this was a tremendously important position on the Fed staff, tremendously demanding as well at that time, but tremendously important because It was very involved in helping policymakers navigate through this very challenging policy situation. And the the markets group was kind of at the center of it all. You know, we were the primary connection of the FOMC to financial markets. We had to provide financial market expertise, financial market updates to them. But operationally, it was also very demanding. We were running six of the eight liquidity facilities that had been launched during the financial crisis. And we were conducting the large scale asset purchases in treasuries and MBS securities. And that was the first time, of course, that the Fed was doing these asset purchases in such large scale and with a a very different purpose. So this was really sort of focused on the creation of a new policy instrument in terms of QE and figuring out how it worked, how to implement it, and all the issues associated with it. So it's really a a tremendous period of policy innovation, and it it was great to be a part of that. Well, let me go back to your earlier career at the Federal Reserve. So you're at the Board of Governors. You're an economist there. And if I recall correctly, the first time I saw your name was on a paper, I think I read. You and Ben Bernanke, maybe someone else. You had a paper that you wrote with him. Is that right? Yes, with uh, Vincent Reinhardt as well. 
I was very fortunate to be able to work on that. That was a paper, you know, looking at the policy options that central banks have when interest rates get pressed up against the lower bound. And this was written in 2003 and 2004, interest rates weren't at the lower bound. So this was really looking ahead at a risk scenario and trying to answer the question of like, does the central bank still have tools in that situation? So the fact that we ended up there and we ended up there with Ben Bernanke as the chairman of the Fed, you know, it was quite interesting for me. And uh, I'd been thinking about those sorts of issues, you know, for, for a long time, dating back to that paper. Yeah, that was an interesting paper. And I remember, you know, during that time, we had Japan on our minds from the late 1990s. And if I recall correctly, 2003, 2004, there was disinflation occurring. And I remember, I believe the FOMC was talking about the prospects of deflation eventually emerging. So the context was very ripe for your paper at that time. So you mentioned that eventually you went to the New York Fed after being at Macroeconomic Advisors. And did your previous time at the Fed help that work there? Did you know people have contacts in place that facilitated your work managing the Fed's balance sheet? Yeah, absolutely. And that's true, you know, on the staff level and also on the policymaker level. So the New York Fed, you know, works very closely with the Board of Governors in Washington, D.C., and really with people throughout the Federal Reserve System on all of these issues. There was tremendous interaction in particular between the markets group that I was running in New York and the Division of Monetary Affairs at the board. And so having those relationships and, and knowing the key staff members there certainly, you know, was useful. And it was a, an extremely collaborative environment. I mean, there was <laughs> plenty of work to go around. And basically, you know, we had particular expertise in terms of operational issues and interacting with markets. The board had particular expertise in terms of analytical thinking and modeling. And it turned out to just be a great combination. And if you look at many of the memos and briefings done over that period, you know, you'll often see names on them from both Markets Group and Monetary Affairs and other parts of the New York Fed and the Board of Governors. But then in addition to all that, you know, I did have a connection to the key policymakers on the FOMC. So Ben Bernanke was chair and I had interacted with him over the years and, and had written the paper that, that you mentioned. Don Cohn was vice chair and he had been a boss of mine previously and someone I was you know, very close to and, and interacted with extensively. And then Bill Dudley recruited me, or at least asked me to apply and go into the process of applying for that position. And the reason is I'd had a long you know, relationship with him just through various channels, being in, in similar circles and, and just had you know, tremendous respect for him. So, so these three policymakers who could be considered you know, the, the center of the FOMC, you know, I had great relationships with all of them and you know, tremendous respect for each of them as policymakers. Well, that's interesting. And I should note that Don Cohn is a previous guest of the podcast, and I had him on. Very interesting person. We talked with him. He mentioned he started way back in the 70s, and he was there when Paul Volcker was there. And Paul Volcker did his work on bringing inflation down. And he was part of the team back then. Don mentioned he used to go around the country, give talks when they had rates really, really high. So Don has seen a lot, and that's fantastic. He got to work under him. And then, you know, in addition to them, in 2010, Don stepped down and retired from the board. And then Janet Yellen moved in as vice chair. And, and again, very much, you know, fit that same mold of someone I, I was comfortable with and, and knew and, um, and really enjoyed working with. And that's the Troika, right? So you've yes. heard the so-called Troika of the FOMC. The Troika is those three groups of policymakers, chair, vice chair, and president of the New York Fed. And Essentially, you know, there's just a considerable amount of policy discussion that takes place you know, between the Troika in between FOMC meetings. I mean, obviously, the policy decisions are made at the FOMC meeting and they're a committee decision. But in terms of you know, potential directions for policy and you know, what will be put forward in the meeting and really you know, what the leanings of that core of the committee are, you know, for that, there was quite a bit of discussion taking place between meetings in this so-called Troika process. And so that was a that was a real treat to be part of that as a staff member, because these were very interactive discussions. We got to have a lot of input. Yeah. So you were there during some historical moments that you mentioned the QE programs. You came in, I believe, at tell in a QE1. You were there for QE2, the maturity extension program, laid the groundwork for QE3. So a couple of questions surrounding those historic changes at the Fed. Number one, did your group expand dramatically? I mean, was there a lot of changes happening at the staff level to accommodate these new innovations? And then secondly, 
During this time, there was a lot of commentary outside the Fed, like, oh, the Fed's doing QE. What are they thinking? We're going to have hyperinflation. I mean, and on the inside, you've got to just do your job, kind of keep your mouth shut. I asked this question to Bill English when he was on the podcast. Did it ever get frustrating seeing all this commentary from the outside? And you knew better. You knew this is not going to happen. This is actually a a response that's reasonable, given all the context, what's happening. I mean, it was in some ways. So, So to go back to your first question, right, the demands on the staff, I mean, throughout the system, but you know, I had obviously the direct look at the markets group. The demands on the markets group were, were tremendous, and we did grow in size. I think at one point we were above 410 people in the markets group, which sounds like quite a lot. But when you think about the responsibilities that we had, you know, I really think we could have used a lot more staff, to be honest. So, yeah, I mentioned we were running a number of liquidity facilities. We were buying securities on a scale that had not been seen. All of these operational procedures, they have many, many dimensions that you have to you know, consider. You know, they have technology dimensions, reporting dimensions, accounting dimensions, you know, resiliency dimensions. So it really took quite an effort just from an operational perspective you know, to push all this forward. And at the same time, the demand for analysis and market information and market intelligence was, of course, you know, extremely high. So, so I think the staff really did, you know, heroic work over that period. And, you know, I think they've done it uh, a few more times since then. And it's really, you know, just a a testament to, you know, how dedicated they are and and how hard they work. The blowback was frustrating to me personally. I can't speak for others or for policymakers, but for me personally, it was. So, So I was there, you said at the tail end of QE1, but I was actually there for the majority of QE1. QE1, you know, was a a long program, especially after it was extended in in March 2009. It continued into 2010. And to me, you know, the first part of QE1 was very much about market functioning, but the rest of it was about the economy. It was about providing accommodation. So roughly, you know, let's say a third market functioning and then the, the other two thirds policy accommodation. So when we got to the need for QE2, and there was a decision to do QE2, I naturally saw it as an extension of what had been previously done. And by then, I was convinced that, you know, this was a tool that was, you know, it was imperfect, but it, but it had productive effects in terms of helping the FOMC meet its macroeconomic mandate. But the blowback at QE2 was dramatic and, and, and sharp. And it came from the academic community, it came from politicians, it came from market practitioners. It just showed how much, you know, there was just tremendous confusion on how QE works and, and what its effects might be. And QE1 sort of, even though I think two thirds of it was about macroeconomic policy and getting the right policy accommodation, I think people just associated that as, oh, that was a crisis program. So when we got to QE2 and decided we're going to use this instrument, or when the FOMC decided it's going to use this instrument in a more regular way, that's when the blowback, you know, seemed to come. And the blowback, ended up being very wrong, right? Most of the blowback was, this is highly inflationary. You're going to destabilize the dollar, going to cause, you know, extremely high levels of inflation. And it just was not how we saw QE working on the staff level. And I think, you know, ultimately the criticism proved incorrect. An amazing time for you to be at the Fed working on its balance sheet, going through those issues. Now, after that, you transitioned to DE Shaw Group. Tell us about that briefly. As you mentioned, I, I was director of global economics for the DE Shaw Group and sat in the, the firm's discretionary macro team. You know, DE Shaw is a great firm. It's, a, it's a, obviously a global investment and technology firm. And, you know, my role there was to help the macro team look for investment opportunities that were based on economic views and importantly on perceived market inefficiencies within an asset class or across asset classes. Maybe what's interesting about that is the work had many similarities to my previous policy work. In the sense that I was still applying empirical analysis and sort of critical thinking to understanding, you know, what economic and policy factors were driving asset prices and to assessing how they may evolve going forward. It has a different purpose and that different purpose, you know, added new dimensions compared to my earlier work, but sort of the underlying foundation and approach had a lot of similarities. So, you know, I found that transition from policy work to investment work, you know, to be very natural and really, you know, had a, had a great term from my perspective at D. Shaw. One other thing you did while you're at D.E. Shaw and recently completed was a term on the Treasury Borrowing Advisory Committee, or TBAC. And we're going to return to this later in the program, but briefly tell our listeners, what does that committee do? 
Okay, so the TBAC is it's a set of private market participants from leading financial firms that advises the U.S. Treasury on debt management decisions. So I served on it for eight years through August of 2022, with the past couple of years as vice chair. So what happens in that group is it goes down to D.C. four times a year around the quarterly refunding announcements. And it goes into essentially a 24-hour meeting or meeting period, not 24-hour meeting, but a 24-hour period where it meets with the Treasury and has a lot of discussions about debt management decisions. And this is both about what should Treasury issue in the near term, but then also broader debt management questions about you know, introducing new securities or how to think about the optimal structure of the debt and so on. It is an advisory committee. All of those decisions reside with the Treasury completely. And the Treasury has you know, a great staff dedicated to this area. But they look to this group for input from a, a group of people involved in the market who can bring useful information into that process. You know, It's a period. You go down there, you get sequestered, actually, for 24 hours. So you're not allowed to talk to your firm. You're not allowed to talk to anyone professionally. So it's quite a commitment by these members to participate in that. But I think you know, we all saw it as very rewarding work, We're work that really matters, right? It really matters in terms of minimizing the cost of the debt to the government and, and ensuring that the government has adequate and efficient capacity to, to fund itself. So we all saw it as very important and, you know, it's great to be able to play that role. Yeah, that's a fascinating committee and one that's not understood well enough or appreciated well enough. And you know, the debt maturity structure of our federal debt, you guys help shape that, right? The Treasury has to be informed. What does the market want? And you're there to provide that information. And their reports are online. I've gone back and looked at a few of them, including some of yours. And we'll talk about one later. And I would love to go back as I'm thinking about it now, go back and look at one where TIPS was first introduced in the late 90s. I'm sure there was some discussion surrounding those and the demand for those as well. Well, let's move on to the current situation since I have a Fed balance sheet expert with me. I want to talk about where we are today. And as you know, the Fed started a tightening cycle with nearly $9 trillion of assets on its balance sheet. How do we get to this situation and what does it mean for the Fed going forward? So, of course, you know, we got to this situation because the Fed did a, a massive QE program in the wake of the COVID crisis. I mean, the government and the Fed launched a variety of programs uh, after COVID, but it was the asset purchases that really boosted the Fed's balance sheet in a persistent manner. So so that asset purchase program, which I'll refer to as as QE4, that program ended up purchasing $4.6 trillion in treasury securities and mortgage-backed securities. You know, that's much larger than any of the earlier waves of QE that were implemented after the, the global financial crisis. And, you know, what drove that size? Well, I think there were really two issues. One was the considerable strains in in markets that we saw in 2020. And you've had previous guests on who have discussed those in great detail. I won't go through that. But the short version is, you know, the purchases ended up having to be very aggressive given the size of the pressure we were seeing in the markets and, you know, incredible need by investors to liquidate their holdings of those securities and other securities given the uncertainties in the outlook. So so the FOMC instructed the desk to buy securities as needed to restore market function. And that just ended up being a very large number. I mean, there were periods of time when the New York Fed desk was buying $100 billion a day on average over periods of time. And I think if you look at it, it's a little bit hard to parse how much of the $4.6 trillion was market functioning related. But I think a reasonable guess is, you know, two and a half to three of it or something like that was directly aimed at market functioning. So then the rest of it was what we could call regular QE. And I mentioned this before in terms of the, the last two thirds of QE1. It was, you know, really aimed at, okay, the market functioning was in better balance, but the FOMC decided that it just wanted to make financial conditions more accommodative and more supportive of growth. So it continued the QE program, of course, thereafter. And I think that accounts for the remaining $2 trillion or nearly $2 trillion of that program. I mean, was that all overdone? I mean, I think it was probably a little bit larger than it, it needed to be. And by, you know, a little bit, we're talking like, you know, a trillion dollars or something. You know, I think it, basically the market functioning purchases had to be surprisingly large. But, you know, I think that part was necessary. You know, I think the regular QE in the end continued too long. I mean, it, by the second half of 2021, I don't think an assessment of the, of the economic situation and 
thinking in terms of like a policy rule, I think it'd be hard to find a policy rule that would have suggested that we needed to keep easing into early 2022. So we probably went a little bit further, but even if they had stopped earlier, it wouldn't have mattered. I mean, we, we would have been in the same situation of coming up to this tightening cycle with a very large balance sheet and with a ton of liquidity in the system. So that's how we got to that point. So what is your theory on QE? I've had a number of people on the show before. How does QE make a difference? How does it work? And particularly once you get out of these market supporting periods, you're outside of 2020, you're into 2021, you're outside of 2009, you know, you're, you're moving forward into just the QE2 type programs. How does it work? And I bring that up because I've had guests on the show who think it does very little. They, they invoke a form of Wallace neutrality. And I have others who say, man, it really, it really does do a lot. So where do you come down on that? And what is your theory for it? I think QE works. Well, first of all, during periods of market stress, QE you know, works in different ways. And I, I think we can all agree to that. It can be most potent when it's operating in impaired markets and restoring market function. The harder issue is beyond that, what does it do? My view is QE does have effects. It does have effects on financial conditions. It does help to lower long-term interest rates and make financial conditions more accommodative. It's not as potent as the traditional policy instrument, the short-term interest rate, but that's consistent with how the Fed uses it. It, You know, the Fed uses its short-term interest rates actively when it can, and QE is reserved for those situations where short-term interest rates are constrained by the lower bound and, and more has to be done. I see those effects as associated with the overall size of the balance sheet rather than the monthly flow. And I think that's conventional wisdom inside the Federal Reserve System as well. And, you know, I mean, we've been doing QE for 15 years across a number of central banks. So, you know, we have a decent amount of evidence at this point, you know, suggesting that uh, these balance sheet sizes, you know, do have some beneficial effects on, on financial conditions. That's my general view of QE. It actually brings me to a point, though, if, you know, if we think the effects of QE are associated with the size of the balance sheet and not the flow, I do think it's it's a little puzzling that we've been implementing QE, at least since QE3, at least expressed in terms of this monthly flow of purchases. So if we think the effect is associated with the size of the balance sheet, then we can think of that, the size of the balance sheet, sort of the same way we think of the level of the funds rate, like the degree of accommodation is associated with that. And when we think about policy, and then it makes sense to have a target for the size of the balance sheet. So, you know, when conditions weaken, you know, you want to expand the balance sheet, but I feel like there should be a target size. Even if you're getting there in a monthly flow, that you should be heading to some set stated size, which is how QE1, QE2, and the maturity extension program all operated. They all had particular sizes, 1.75, 600 and 667 billion. Those were the three sizes for those programs. And it was only when we got to QE3, when we got to open-ended, you know, we're going to purchase at this pace and we're not going to tell you how long it's going to go. So just reflecting on that, and maybe this is an aside for, for this conversation, but I do wonder if that sort of contributed to running QE, you know, longer than was really needed in the sense that to change the flow like if the situation remains unchanged, well, in the one case, you're aiming for a size and you get to the size and you stop. In the other case, you're in this monthly flow and, and it has to be an active decision to, to change that and stop. I wonder if we're implementing QE in the right form, you know, as we did in QE3 and QE4 and whether a form with an actual target size of the balance sheet might be better. How would you determine the optimal size of the balance sheet? How would you set that target? Yeah. So roughly speaking, and this is, you know, this is not easy to do in practice, but I think you want to, you know, use some rule of thumb or some estimate for how the size of the balance sheet affects long-term interest rates. Think about that in terms of a funds rate equivalent, and then just put that in like a standard type of policy rule that you would expect for for short-term interest rates. And that's going to depend on your parameters. But again, if you do that exercise, I think the asset purchases through the middle of 2021 made great sense. The funds rate should have been well below zero. It couldn't be because of the lower bound. So you make it up with asset purchases. You can only purchase at a particular pace. So it takes you time to get to the target level. But when I do those exercises under that approach, it suggests by the second half of 2021, you would sort of gotten the balance sheet big enough. The balance sheet was very big by that point. And there was not a compelling case to keep expanding it at that point. Now, when we think about the size of the balance sheet, should we think about it in terms of absolute dollar size or relative to, say, GDP? Yeah, I mean, 
this is really getting into the details, but I, I think of it as 10 year equivalents, which is a way of adjusting for the duration okay. of what you're buying as a share of GDP. Okay. So in some ways then the large balance sheet kind of takes care of itself because over time GDP will grow and, and the, the size of it will shrink relative to GDP. So my last question on the balance sheet was this, do we need to shrink the balance sheet to get kind of the powder dry for the next crisis? Or can we stay with what we have and just keep it stable, but have it shrink relative to GDP? I think you need to shrink the balance sheet. When it's expanded as much as it was during QE4, I think it's advisable to shrink it. They're shrinking it with a very careful plan in a very predictable way. But I think you do want to get it down in size for, you know, several reasons, but one of which the one you mentioned that, you know, you want to be ready for the next time. I think if you didn't shrink it, you know, if you just waited for GDP to grow into it, it wouldn't shrink fast enough. And you would have this ratchet effect where you never kind of completely got it back to normal. One more comment on QE. You know, as I said before, you know, QE is a tool that should be used when the primary instrument is constrained. And we just had two recessions where the primary instrument was constrained. You know, that won't necessarily be the case in every recession. So, you know, I think it is possible to have recessions where we don't resort to QE, but I think it's advisable to retain QE as this supplementary tool Well, if and once we get back into a situation where the short rate is constrained. Okay, well, let's move into the Fed's operating system. And its current system is a floor operating system, or they like to call it ample reserve system. I bring this up because you and Joe Gagnon had this paper we alluded to earlier that touches on the Fed's operating system. The title of it was Monetary Policy with Abundant Liquidity, a New Operating Framework for the Federal Reserve. And you wrote it in 2014, but some of the proposed changes in it have yet to be implemented. So we want to talk about those and how they could improve the Fed's current and floor operating system. But on this show, Brian, I've had a lot of people who are critical of the floor system, as you may know, friends of yours and mine. And I, I want to give the floor system fair time. I want, I want to make the case for the floor system. So walk us through the arguments for the floor system and why we should continue to embrace it. So first of all, I mean, we are stuck in a floor system for now, so we can we can have this debate, but given the size of the balance right. coming into this tightening cycle, we're in a floor system. But even, you know, if we had a choice or, or when we have a choice, you know, I would argue the floor system's very attractive. I mean, I think the floor system is working exceptionally well, at least for what it's designed to achieve. So what is it designed to achieve? It is designed to achieve effective control of overnight market interest rates under a variety of outcomes for the balance sheet size. And that control has been very, very strong. So the SOFA rate, which is the benchmark repo rate, probably the most important overnight interest rate in our financial system, that has been largely pinned to the rate set on the Fed's overnight reverse repo facility, or at least within a few basis points of that facility rate. And the federal funds rate has remained remarkably stable in the center of the target range set by the FOMC. So the system is working. And I want to note that the system is working under fairly extreme conditions. You know, we talk about stress tests for banks. I mean, if anyone thought we should apply a stress test to the operational regime, well, you know, we've done that. You know, we expanded the balance sheet to $9 trillion dollars before a tightening cycle, and yet control of overnight interest rates has been very effective. You know, I think we really should recognize that and recognize, you know, the benefits and the effectiveness of this system. Another aspect of this related to all that is, you know, the floor system, one, one of its advantages over a corridor system was that it would allow the Fed to use the balance sheet for other purposes. So, of course, we've been talking about QE and the Fed felt the need to expand the balance sheet you know, dramatically in 2020, initially to support market functioning. And, you know, the system allowed that. Now, that would have been fine under a quarter because the, like, the rate went to zero and so rates would have been pinned to zero. But then more recently, we have another example that that shows this. So, you know, the Fed just expanded the balance sheet by more than $300 billion to support the banking sector. You know, it allowed a surge in discount window lending. It launched a new lending facility, the bank term funding program, all of that to deal with recent banking strains. And being in a floor system gives the Fed the flexibility to do that and not to have to worry about, you know, how it's going to sterilize those reserve injections, whether it can continue to hit its target rate. So it gives it this degree of freedom to do other productive things with its balance sheet. 
So essentially, I, th I think the system is working well. And the 2014 paper with Joe, I mean, I appreciate you mentioning that. It was a Peterson Institute for International Economics policy brief. Our goal in that paper really was to explain a floor system and explain how the tools the Fed has at its disposal, in particular, paying interest on reserve balances and running this overnight RRP facility, how they all fit together in a way that's coherent and supports a floor system. I guess we'll get to some of these details. You know, I mean, they didn't do everything we said in the paper, but besides those details, I think kind of just giving the overall framework and, and you know, understanding how the floor system operates with these tools, like that was our, our broad purpose in that paper. You've just explained one of the big arguments for the floor operating system, and that is it separates the size of the Fed's balance sheet from the stance of policy. So it has that extra degree of freedom. It can adjust the size of the balance sheet and still keep a certain policy rate because now the policy rate is an administered rate. Whereas before in the quarter system, they were linked, right? In order to adjust the stance of policy, you had to adjust the size of the balance sheet. So you couldn't have that flexibility that you just alluded to. And I, I think you're right. What we just went through is a great textbook example of how a floor system has that extra flexibility. The Fed didn't have to adjust its policy rate, but it did adjust the size of its balance sheet, which is a great thing. Now, critics would say that could also be a downfall because if the Fed can, you know, peg its, its policy rate and have flexibility on its balance sheet, it might be a tempting target for different political factions, you know, different desires of Congress. And so what, I guess some of the critiques you hear about the floor system are often political ones. Does this endanger the Fed? Does it make it more susceptible to political pressure, to Congress trying to steal money or to, you know, to use its balance sheet for pet projects? What are your thoughts on that? So my thoughts on that are, you know, the operating system of the central bank is is not the vehicle <laughs> to resist that or to try to, you know, achieve particular political outcomes. Look, you know, the Congress has given the Fed a clear macroeconomic mandate. I think that's, you know, really been the beacon for everything that, you know, the Fed does with its balance sheet. And it's up to Congress and you know the American public to decide you know is that the right objective or not. The argument of somehow constraining the Fed from doing something because you know you're going to be in a corridor system just <laughs> it seems like it seems like the wrong approach for that. Fair enough. The problem should be addressed at Congress directly, not through some mechanism imposed on the Fed. What about losses on the Fed's balance sheet? That's another critique we often hear these days. And I've had you know people on the show recently talking about that. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, changes in the income on the SOMA portfolio and also, you know, unrealized gains and losses on the SOMA portfolio. Well, first of all, you know, they aren't the primary consideration for the FOMC. You know, the FOMC is focused on the macroeconomic mandate that we just talked about. That that mandate is you know, stable prices and full employment. So they have the dual mandate that is their focus. And I think they regard the income stream on SOMA as, you know, a residual outcome from those efforts. You know, not one, you know, to be ignored, but one that falls behind actually meeting the economic mandate that they've been given. We are seeing losses on the SOMA portfolio now. And actually the New York Fed yesterday released the annual report on open market operations for 2022. So we have a nice timely reading and discussion on all that. So the net interest income on the portfolio turned negative in the second half of last year. And this is because short rates have risen sharply, of course. So that's the cost to the Fed of, of, of the SOMA balance sheet, the way the balance sheet is funded in some sense. And in addition, it reported that SOMA has large unrealized losses on the portfolio, you know, in the order of a trillion dollars. But I guess my point would be you can't you can't have it both ways. You know, if we think the balance sheet works by removing duration risk from the market and influencing the price of long-term interest rates because they don't have to bear that interest rate risk, well then, you know, you can't turn around and say, well, this is a problem that we had losses when interest rates moved, you know, against the portfolio. You know, they go together. I think it's an unavoidable consequence of, of QE that the SOMA has this exposure because it's exactly how it works. Now, you know, of course, you know, the size of it all matters. So in this case, you know, the balance is particularly large and rates had a, a really violent move to the upside, surprising everyone, surprising the markets right. and the Fed. Yeah. So the circumstances, you know, are somewhat extreme in terms of leading to the size of the loss in the books right now. But I think, you know, some exposure is unavoidable. And if I could just say one more thing about the exposures, I think some have suggested that 
the Fed's not always, you know, transparent about these losses, or maybe some have even suggested they don't, you know, fully understand their meaning. And and I, I just I would push back on that, you know, as hard as I possibly can. I'll give you a little history, markets group history on, on this one. So in 2009, I set up a new directory called Portfolio Analytics inside the markets group because the, you know obviously the balance sheet had grown a lot. We wanted to understand all of its attributes and all of the risks involved. It proved very valuable for assessing a lot of policy issues along the way. And one product it produced were projections for the balance sheet and projections for the income from the balance sheet. And we began to publish those projections in the annual report on open market operations in 2010. It was a new thing. I, I went to Chair Bernanke and asked if we should include this in the report. We had a lot of discussion about that, but he agreed, thought it was a good step for transparency. And so those projections have been produced routinely and published routinely ever since 2010. And as I said, most recently yesterday in the most recent report. And on top of all that, in 2013, the Federal Reserve Board put out a research paper that you know very extensively and thoroughly went through how to make these projections. I think these exposures are well understood and have been relatively transparent. Okay. Well, let's talk about your paper on the floor system with Joe Gagnon, because you make the case for the floor system, but you have some specific recommendations, and I think they're very relevant to today, because today we have this really large overnight reverse repo facility. It's it's blown up. There's a lot of funds flowing to that. And you have a a proposal or suggestion on how to set the rate on that relative to the interest on reserves in terms of making the floor system more effective. Right. So so we thought that the rates on the RRP facility and the rates paid on reserves should be relatively close to each other or even set equal to each other. The broad concept behind that was that you know the market can efficiently decide where it wants to allocate liquidity created by the Fed. So when the Fed buys assets, it creates liquidity in the form of some overnight asset, one being bank reserves, one being overnight reverse repo transactions. That liquidity, I mean, to a large extent, has to be in one of those two forms. The RRPs were created because we wanted that liquidity to be able to be held outside the banking system. So what Joe and I had in mind was, you know, the Fed sort of creates a total amount of, let's call it Fed liquidity, that will be held in one of these two forms. And the financial system can efficiently decide, like, what's the best way to hold that liquidity? If the banks need more liquidity, they will compete more by, you know, paying more on deposits and other ways to get the liquidity. If they don't want the liquidity, then they will compete less and you'll see the the liquidity flow into money funds and into the reverse repo facility. And I think conceptually, that's like a very clean, efficient, equitable system. And we've seen that to some degree in recent years. You know, the QE we've been talking about was so large, it created so much liquidity that the banks didn't want all those deposits. So they actually purposefully tried to push some deposits out and then they pushed them out into the, the, the money fund sector. And then as rates have gone up, we've seen banks, you know, even lose more deposits because money fund rates have gone up faster than bank deposit rates. But to me, you know, I like that idea that the system can decide where to hold the liquidity and can reallocate efficiently. I like that as well. I like the market solution here. Let the market determine where these resources should flow. And I like the way you frame this. You prefer to call this the floor system, an abundant liquidity regime versus the abundant reserve regime. The Fed likes to say it's an abundant reserve, but you would prefer the abundant liquidity. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And that's exactly for this reason that I think just to start by thinking about Fed liquidity and then, you know, let the market sort of allocate it. This issue is extremely relevant today, right? Because obviously we're seeing, you know, pressure on the banking system or pressure on particular segments of the banking system. They are, you know, losing deposits and some of those deposits are flowing into money market funds. And so the question has come up of like, well, isn't this RRP facility, you know, dangerous and causing, you know, instability or even more broadly, even before the recent pressure, you know, like, shouldn't we be actively pushing down the size of reverse repos just to get the liquidity back into the banks? And I just think that doesn't seem like a very productive policy step to me. Basically, you know, so there are calls to reduce the RRP rate relative to the interest rate on reserves to try to basically to push assets out of money funds and back into the banking sector. 
But, you know, there's a couple of problems with that. The biggest problem being, you know, if you start reducing the rate on the RRP facility, you are going to lower market interest rates and you are going to compromise your policy setting in a way that's, you know, not clearly going to shove funds back into the banks, you know, that need them, right? It's not like all the money coming out of government only money market funds is going to flow back into uninsured deposits in you know, regional banks. So I think it's sort of ill-advised to you know, start to manipulate the operating regime of the Fed, one that's proven to give very effective control of overnight interest rates in a way that's you know, trying to support particular banks. It just, it's beyond the scope of what you know, the operating system is constructed for. Yeah, and we could keep talking about the Fed's operating system for a long time. It's really fascinating to me. But for the sake of time, Brian, I want to move on to your work at the Treasury Borrowing Advisory Committee because you did some interesting work there. And I've had previous guests on the show that speak to the issue of enhancing the robustness and resiliency of the Treasury market. But a number of proposals we've touched on, we won't go over all of them here, but just briefly to summarize them, increased central clearing, all-to-all trading, the extended repo facility was supposed to be one partial fix, maybe tweaking the supplemental leverage ratio would be another one. But something that you worked on that touches on this is treasury buybacks, having the treasury department itself participate in buybacks. And you did that, I believe, as part of your last work there on the committee. So walk us through that and, and how would it work? Well, you know, to start big picture, I mean, clearly the resilience of the treasury market is a very important policy issue. This is, you know, a critical market, not just for the government and funding itself, but just for how financial markets operate. You know, it's a benchmark market and, you know, a deep and liquid market that investors rely on. So I think these efforts to improve its resilience are really critical. And, you know, there's a lot of people, a lot of groups working on this, including the Interagency Working Group for Treasury Market Surveillance. Some of this was discussed at the annual Treasury Conference held at the New York Fed. Those are all important initiatives. As you noted, the issue of buybacks has come up on TBAC. It actually came up back in 2015. There was a charge so on debt management issues, TBAC is given a charge, often given a charge or, or sometimes two charges to address particular topics. A member will create a presentation and put forward a view. And those presentations are public. They're on the Treasury's website. So back in 2015, this issue came up and was addressed. And I would put it in the category of like, OK, like I didn't go into the meeting thinking, you know, this is a key initiative. But when you think it through, it actually makes uh, a lot of sense. And and it makes a lot of sense because treasury securities get less liquid as they age. And so it's one of these policy steps. So basically the proposal is, well, treasury you know, could have some predictable regular policy for buying age securities and replacing them with newly issued securities, which tend to be more liquid. And it's one of those policy proposals that both you know, makes the markets function better and, you know, serves, probably reduces the borrowing cost to the treasury because you're buying things that are cheaper and less liquid and, and issuing stuff that's more liquid. So it could improve market liquidity and it could also, you know, just help with debt management in terms of managing, you know, the maturity structure and, and when new securities have to be issued. So in 2015, it seemed interesting, but didn't prompt additional discussions or presentations. But it's come up again recently in recent TBAC meetings, including the last one where there was a very nice presentation, again, on the website about it. I wasn't at those meetings, so I'm not <laughs> revealing anything, but just reading the material, I think this is a proposal that that has legs and has some real benefits. As I understand it, this is not a buyback program that's going to be used during financial crises. So like okay. when you talk about the Fed having to step in in 2020 and buy a couple of trillion dollars of securities, it's hard to do that through treasury because when the Fed buys securities, it creates liquidity, it creates reserves and reverse repos. When the treasury buy securities, it has to fund it by issuing other securities. So they, it's very hard for them to ramp up a couple trillion dollars of purchases on short order. But this is more of a, you know, a regular predictable presence in the market to support liquidity and, and help their debt management. Yeah, that was my question. When would you use it? So I was thinking, would it have been useful, for example, during March 2020? And you're saying probably not. It's more effective during normal times. I mean, there is an open issue, perhaps, about, you know, if you need to do sizable asset purchases at times for market functioning, is that better to do through the central bank or through the fiscal authority? But I think the working assumption at this point is that falls to the central bank. 
And in terms of the proposals currently in front of Treasury or the ones TBAC has been working on, it is not that. It is a, a smaller, more predictable buyback program. So, Brian, in the time we have left, we're talking about the Treasury market. I want to end on the standing repo facility. One of the reasons it was created was to make it easier for banks to you know, convert treasuries into reserves and vice versa. But it hasn't had a lot of participation. A lot of banks haven't joined it. I know primary dealers are automatically a part of it. But you really need buy-in from the banks writ large, and we haven't seen it. So is this a facility that will be useful, or does it need to actually go through you know, a test, go through a crisis to really get its teeth? I think this is a facility that that is useful, and I was I was happy to see them launch this facility for the private sector, and then also they launched the FEMA repo facility for foreign central bank customers, which has similar effects. I think it's useful for holders of treasuries to be able to monetize the debt in situations where they don't want to just do outright sales. This, in many ways, automates what the desk would be doing in any case, because if repo rates firm up, move higher, they're likely to drag Fed funds higher. And how would the Fed, you know, respond to that and maintain the fund rate target? They would do repo to put more liquidity in the system. So this just makes it transparent and clear. It lets them broaden the counterparty set. You know, maybe there's an open issue of whether the counterparty set, you know, needs to be broadened further, but I think it is productive. I wouldn't worry so much that it's not being used. I think the whole purpose here is really to have it be a guardrail that would kick in under market stress. So this is not a system where, you know, sort of the RRP facility and the RP facility are like symmetric and both active, right? You know, the floor system means we should normally be pressed up against the, the RRP facility, taking the funds in and only on occasion under stress would we you know need to use the RP facility, which is putting funds back out into the market. So that's that's the design, and um, and I think it's effective. And that would have been useful, for example, in the repo crisis of 2019. Yes, that would have been useful in the repo crisis of 2019, and even in 2020, the desk you know did do large scale repos as at least an initial response to the events. Now, I think the pressures were so great that they had to do market purchases. And, you know, the SRF doesn't mean that like they will never have to do market functioning purchases again, but it's it's at least helpful and, and works in that direction. Well, with that, our time is up. Our guest today has been Brian Sack. Brian, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yep. Thank you, David. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Dive deeper into our research at mercatus.org forward slash monetary policy. You can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. If you like this podcast, please consider giving us a rating and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the show. Find me on Twitter at David Beckworth and follow the show at macro underscore musings.